Well, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we've actually we've spent about the last month or so, and we've been working through the book of 1 Timothy. And we've been doing it by going really paragraph by paragraph and section by section. Um, we only missed one little paragraph, but we actually used that instead in the context of a worship service. So we've, we've gone along each paragraph, and one of the advantages of that, of course, is that you hear everything that a book is saying. You get to hear God's whole message for his church in, in, in each book that we're covering. So we've heard a lot of things already through the book of 1 Timothy. We haven't missed anything. But of course, one of the challenges of that, and maybe you might even call it a difficulty, I guess, is that you don't miss anything. And so when you come to a passage like this one, which is bound to be unpopular, you can't skip over it. Right? You can't run, you can't hide, you can't duck and cover. It's there. And we have to face it. We have to listen to it. We have to listen to what this passage is all about. And we have to at least wrestle with it and grapple with it and try to come to grips with what God is saying to his church. Even when the message or even when the words may be, uh, may be unpopular, especially in today's day and age. So we have to take the time this morning to, to listen carefully, I think, to what God is saying to us in, in, uh, in the context of men and women in worship. Now, you may be a little bit skeptical this morning, or you, as you heard it this morning, and you heard some of the things that Paul is saying to the church, there may be some red flags or yellow flags going up in your mind that says, wait a minute, this, you know, this doesn't mean anything today. That's okay. Let's, let's try to address some of those questions. Let's try to address some of those uh, concerns as we go through this text this morning. Uh, one of the first things I think we need to do when we come to a passage that is as challenging as this one, we need to re remember to look at it in the bigger context. And the big context, the big picture here is that Paul is speaking to Timothy. Paul is the experienced pastor, and he's writing to a younger pastor, Timothy, and he's giving instructions on how the church is to worship and live together in community. So this book is all about how the church does life together. It's all about how the church lives, worships, serves, ministers together as one body. Now, the more specific context is that Paul is speaking to the, to the context and to the topic of worship. Um, if you remember from last week, if you were here, you remember that we talked about Paul was, was encouraging us and God was encouraging us to be people of prayer. He, he wanted us to be, he wants the whole church to be a praying church, a church that is praying for her leaders, praying for people in need, all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. But now Paul, as he's writing this letter, he's, he's focusing us in and he's speaking to the, to the context of local worship and, and the role of men and women in the context of worship. And the first thing that Paul says is actually, I think, in some ways, it's, it's fairly straightforward. He addresses the men and their role in leadership. And he, he, he says, men, I want men everywhere to be lifting up hands, holy hands, in worship, without quarreling, without arguing, for this is pleasing to God. Now, you read that, and, and I think you can draw the conclusion that there was something wrong in the church, because the men weren't doing this. The, the church, the men of the church were not leading in prayer. They were not a praying people. And when they were praying, they were doing it in a very superficial, a very shallow way. Because Paul says, pray without quarreling and without arguing, which suggests that they were doing a lot of quarreling and a lot of arguing. And so what that meant was that you, let's just imagine you're outside in the fellowship hall, you're quarreling and you're arguing with someone, perhaps about some question of doctrine or some question of Christian living, how a Christian should live. In Paul's day, it was probably theological disputes, and they're fighting and they're quarreling about this. Then they get together in the sanctuary, and they begin to worship, and they are praying together. But because of all that quarreling and arguing and fighting and divisiveness in the church, their prayers were, were very superficial, very surfacey. The prayers were not pleasing to God because it, it was just a, a sort of a thin veneer over an otherwise sharply divided church. And what God's desire is for his church is that the church be united together so that when they come together and when they are in prayer together, it's not superficial, it's not shallow, but it's a reflection of the deep bond that holds the church of Jesus Christ together. And then <clears throat> Paul actually builds on this 
And he says, I want you to be lifting up your hands in prayer. What do you think God desires from that? What does that really mean for us? On the one hand, some, some of us here, we actually do lift our hands in worship, and you can be affirmed in that. You can do that knowing that the Bible speaks positively of that. You are free to lift your hands in worship. But is it required? I mean, when we pray, should we all lift up our hands? Well, no, not necessarily. In Paul's day, lifting up your hands in worship was actually a, a, a way of showing your dependence and your trust in God. You would lift up your hands and that was the way that you were showing that you were surrendering yourself over to God, that you depended on Him. And I'll help you understand that there are a couple of scripture verses, and I'm not going to read the verses individually, but I'll, I'll give them to you here. You can jot them down and then go back and look them up um, later. Psalm 141, verse 2, and Psalm 143, verse 6. Psalm 141, verse 2, and 143, verse 6. Both give a clear um, example of the, of the psalmist saying, I lift up my hands and I spread them before you because I trust in you. So lifting up your hands was a way of saying as a church, we come together united before God and we are dependent on God and we are seeking to surrender ourselves to God. That's the, the picture, that's the desire that God has for his church. He has the men of the church, the men of the leaders of the congregation lifting up their hands, trusting in and depending on God in worship. Now, by the way, does this mean that only men can pray? Of course not. We know that's not true. There are places in the Bible where women are praying, of course. But there's a unique way in which the men are to be leading the church in prayerful leadership and prayerful surrender before God by lifting up their hands in prayer. I don't know, some of you, um, some of you are, you've got little kids running around at home, and maybe you actually know what this is like, because when you, when you go into you, the kid's room, a little baby, like one, two years old, and they're done taking a nap, and they're standing up there in the crib, and you remember what happens next when you open the door and you go in the room, what does the little child do? Because they're, it's, it's an expression of trust, it's I'm looking to you, and that's kind of the image that God has, that's kind of the desire that God has for his people Lifting up hands in trust and dependence on God. As a church, coming together in prayer. And the men are leading in this. So what does this mean for us today? Well, again, we can say this to all people. We're all to be praying in this way. But specifically, the men are set apart here and they are singled out to have a role in this. To have a leadership role in prayer. And so I want to I want to address then just... Men who are leaders in the home, the church, family, make sure that you are praying people. You have a calling to be prayerful leaders. That you are cultivating your own prayer life. That you are praying for your spouse. That you are praying for your family, for your children. That you are praying for the needs of others. That you are showing by example that you are dependent on God. And that you, by your prayer life, <clears throat> are showing your trust in and submission to God in prayer. Right? Your prayer life is to show your surrender and your trust and dependence on God. You know, someone that's really taught me a lot about this is Pastor Gabe. Many of you know Pastor Gabe from Philadelphia. He's a uh, pastor of our sister congregation there in Philly. And uh, for three or four years now, we've had this partnership where we've gone back and forth. We've gone there, and they've come to us, and we've worked and ministered together and learned from each other. Uh, a couple of years ago, when, uh, when they were here, um, I was about midway through the week. I think it was on a Wednesday night, about 9 o'clock, and I was really kind of tired. It was halfway through their time here, and I was just, I sat down. I just wanted to watch a little bit of TV, and then I was going to go to bed and just crash and sleep. And just after night, I just sat down, and the phone rings, and it's, it's Pastor Gabe. And Pastor, I said, Pastor Gabe, how's it going? He said, well, not, not so good, Rob. He says, we've got someone on our team. We think they need to go to the hospital and get checked out. So I thought, okay, we've got, you know, of course. We'll, I'll get up, and we'll do this. And uh, my thinking, now, as I'm walking from my house over to here to church, I'm thinking, okay, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes to drive to the hospital, drop them off, 12 minutes to come home. I'll be home in a half hour, then I can just go to sleep and... So I get over to church and come in, find the group, and they're still getting their stuff together. It was taking a little longer than they thought. I thought, okay, no worries. We can be patient here. Finally, they get everything together. They're ready to go off to the hospital. And 
Uh, and then Pastor Gabe says, wait, before we go, we need to pray. And then I was kind of divided. I thought, well, I'd really like to just go and let the doctors do their thing. But I thought, no, 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 this is good. Let's, let's pray. So he gets the whole team together. And in my mind, I thought, let's, this will be just a kind of a short prayer. So let's, and then we can get going. No, what was wrong again? <laughs> Pastor Gabe, he starts praying. He's inviting the other people to pray in. And, and I sort of went through a little bit of a change. At first, I was impatient. And I just wanted to get going so I could get home to bed. And then I realized this is so important. This is so important because Gabe is showing and impressing upon me and upon the team we are dependent on God. That in whatever situation, whatever circumstance, we are trusting in God. We are depending on Him. And we, are, we show that and we demonstrate that in prayer. Even if we don't raise our hands, we are showing that we are fully dependent on God for all things. Pray with uplifted hands. United, not quarreling, not divided. Showing your dependence on God. All right, so far so good. Now we get into something that's a little more challenging, where Paul starts talking about braided hair and jewelry and gold and pearls, and you're thinking in the back of your mind, or right there in the front of your mind, you're thinking, what does Paul have against fashion here? What does he have against jewelry? What's the problem with... I, I don't, by the way, I didn't check if anyone has came to church with a braid in their hair this morning. If you did, I really hope you didn't feel the need to go and take it out or something like that, because really Paul is after something a little bit deeper here. And if you have your Bibles open, I want you to, to look with me at verses 9 and 10. This gets a little bit technical, but I think it will help you see what Paul is really after here. Verses 9 and 10, there are really three statements made one right after the other. The, and and the, the, the first and the third are positive statements. They're, they're, at, they're, they're really commands to do something say positive, and then in the middle is a, a negative statement, a prohibition, something not to do. And what we're meant to do is, is look at these three statements and to, to equate the first and the third together, and then to contrast that with the second. Again, I know we're getting a little technical, but, but look here. The third one said, but the middle one, the negative one says, don't dress with braided hair, gold pearls, or expensive clothes, but rather dress modestly. So Paul is saying, Dress modestly, not lavishly, not extravagantly. But then Paul is also comparing good deeds with braided hair. So don't wear braided hair, but, sh but live with good deeds. And we're meant to see a contrast there. To boil it all down, here's what Paul is saying. Here's what he's really after. He's saying, um, you're, the way that you dress says something about the way that you live. If you, are, if you are all focused on lavish clothing and brand names and designer labels and having the, the fanciest wardrobe around, and if all you want to do is impress other people with the kind of clothing that you're wearing, you've gotten all caught up in the wrong kind of beauty. Did you get that? Paul is saying if you are so caught up in physical appearance, you become preoccupied with the wrong kind of beauty. See, biblically, the beauty that is most pleasing to God, the beauty that is true beauty in God's sight, the beauty that we ought to be measuring ourselves against, is what is beautiful in God's eyes. And what is beautiful in God's eyes? Well, that's where you take a look at verse 10. Good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. It's a life of service. It's a life of good deeds. It's a life of loving other people. It's a life of committing yourself to, to meeting the needs of others. That is beautiful in God's sight. That is beautiful. And so, if you wanted to say it simply, you'd say focus on the kind of beauty that pleases God. Focus your hearts and your minds on the beauty that is truly beautiful in God's eyes. Now, a lot of people look at this passage and they say, look, this is, this is one of these passages that, that's actually oppressive to women. But I want to suggest to you that it's actually liberating. You know, you know we live in a world obsessed with beauty. Don't we? Don't we? You stand, I've said this before, you stand in the checkout lane at the grocery store and you see the magazines, People Magazine, Most Beautiful People of the Year, and you are being hit with that standard of what beauty is really like. You are, being, you are coming face to face with that standard. If you want to be beautiful, this is what you need to look like. This is the size and shape of your body. This is the wardrobe you need to wear. You watch those shows on, 
what is it, TLC or whatever network it is, what not to wear, fashion police. What's the message? If you want to be beautiful, you need to look like this. That is oppressive. That is suffocating. That is crushing. That is crushing. And what God says to us is that if you want to be beautiful, beauty is found in the life that you live. It's a life of service to others. It's a life of good deeds and obedience to Him. All right, so far so good. The last paragraph here is maybe the most challenging. Because it talks about a woman learning in quietness and in submission and not teaching and not having authority. And I don't know about you, but as, we, as I was reading this this morning, again, maybe those hairs on the back of your neck stand up or those yellow red flags go up in your mind. Like, Wait a minute. This is, see, this is just proves that the Bible is outdated. It proves that the Bible is sexist and repressive. But let's, let's check our own cultural assumptions that we are reading into this text. I think that's a good place to start by, by checking in our own mind what are the assumptions that have shaped us, cultural assumptions about women and men, and what are the assumptions that we are bringing to the table? And then let's work to separate fact from fiction. Because a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, well, you see, the Bible teaches that a, the Bible says that a woman can never teach. And that is false. Again, if you want to jot down some verses to go back and, and look up a little bit later, Titus chapter 2, verse 3, Acts 18, 26, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. Did you get all that? I'll say it again. Titus 2, verse 3. Acts 18, verse 26, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. In these passages, women are specifically, they are told to teach. They are told to give instruction. They're told to mentor and to instruct new believers, younger people in the life of the church. So no, the Bible does not give a, a blanket prohibition to women in all forms of teaching. That's false. The second, um, the second objection we might have when we read a text like this, well, the Bible is sexist. The Bible just represses the role of women in society. Now, I realize and I can see that a passage like this has been twisted around, and yes, it has been misused, yes, it has been distorted in, in certain places and in certain cases. But by and large, by and large, when you consider the whole trajectory of Scripture, and when you consider the whole trajectory of, of human history and the spread of the gospel and the spread of Christianity, Christianity has consistently improved the standing of women in society. It actually affirms the value of women more than many other cultures over history have. It elevates them. So it's, it's false to say that the Bible is simply sexist and against women and it represses them. That is historically false. And then finally, final objection, can a woman, does this mean that a woman can never lead in any area of society, right? Can a woman never be a, a CEO or the executive of a company? Uh, is this talking that, is this saying that women can never be leaders in the broader society? The answer again, you can guess where I'm going with this is false. Because Paul is talking here about the context of worship, and he's applying this to men and women in the context of worship. So what is he saying here? Take a look. Let's start with verse 13. Adam was formed first, and then Eve. Very simply, what, what Paul is reminding the church of is that there is an order in creation, not a, not a value. We'll actually come back to that in a minute. This doesn't mean women, Adam was firm, firm, formed first, therefore he's better. It's just saying there's an order. Adam was formed first and then Eve, and there is then a leadership role that is given to man. Man are, men and women are created differently with different roles uh, in, in which they serve. Uh, the man, men were created to be loving and caring servant leaders in their homes. Men and women servant leaders, and women then were created to honor and to support and to co-labor with men. Did you get that? Men are created to be loving and caring servant leaders, and women are created to honor and support and co-labor, work together with men. 
that was the, the context of Adam and Eve in the, and the, uh, in the Garden of Eden for the home. But then you'll notice, um, and we covered this verse actually a few weeks ago, in chapter 3, verse 15 of, of Timothy, and there are other places in Second or 1 Timothy, Paul uses household language, family language, to talk about what the church is. He, he's saying that the church is really an expanded household, an expanded family. And so it follows then that if the church is a reflection of the home, then the leadership of the home is also follows the leadership that, that follows in the church. Church leadership reflects home leadership. And so the leadership that's established in the home also plays out in the life of the church. Leadership in the home plays out in the life of the church. Now, what does this, uh, what does this look like? Um, verse 12 I think is one of these places where we, again, we run stuck. The second part of verse 12. Paul says, I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority. She must be silent. Now, let's start with that verse there, that, that last phrase, she must be silent, because we hear that and we assume that a woman has to sit in church, zip her lips, never say anything, never contribute anything to any part of the worship or the life of the church. But that's not what Paul is saying. That's not the meaning of this. That's not exactly the meaning of, of this, uh, this verse or this instruction. One of the ways that we can get at what, what God is after here is by taking that little word quiet, and it actually occurs twice in our text, and looking at other places in the, in the New Testament where we find that same word. And it turns out it's only a handful of other times. But one of the most telling examples in the, is in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 18. Paul is uh, he's leading this big rally, you might call it, in the city. I think it's in the city of Ephesus. I could be wrong on that. My memory may not be right on that. But the point is, he's in front of this large group of people, and things are out of hand. The people are yelling, they're rioting, they're at the point of just mass chaos in this, this amphitheater. And finally, Paul begins to speak up, and he speaks in Aramaic, which was a different language than they expected. And when they heard him speaking in Aramaic, then we read that the whole crowd got quiet. The whole crowd got quiet. Now what that suggests is, that the whole crowd began to pay attention and to be attentive. They began to listen. They went from being that, you might say, fourth grade classroom that was all out of hand when the teacher is gone to settling down and the teacher came to the front of the classroom. A similar idea. What Paul is saying and what God desires for his church is that when the church gathers together for worship and when the, the, someone is up front leading, then the church and the women Respect the honor, the authority, and the leadership of the church. That's what um, is being described here. It's not silence, it's not never say a word, it's not women have nothing good to say. It's a posture that honors the leadership of men. What about the teaching part? First part of verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority. You need to take those two little phrases together, teach and authority. And what you find is that those two words, those two words, they do occur together um, in other places in 1 Timothy, but also in other places in, uh, in the New Testament. And that refers specifically to the work and to the office of the elder. And so what, what Paul is saying is that a woman doesn't have any authority anywhere. He's saying, and he's not saying I can never have a woman teaching anything. He's saying, I do not permit women to hold the office of elder in the life of the church. That's what he's saying. That, that's what he's saying. Now, that last phrase, it's verse, um, verse 15, is a challenge. Because Paul says, um, a woman, uh, women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, I'll just tell you up front that this is one of these verses that puzzles a lot of people. It stumps a lot of good, intelligent, educated theologians. And so we're not going to pretend to solve the mystery here automatically. But I will say this. Here's what that passage, I think, leads us to conclude, that we can say with certainty. Just as sin entered the world through the disobedience of Eve in the Garden of Eden, that does not mean that God wrote off women and forever cursed them and said there's nothing more to do with them, but he actually says salvation will also come through a woman who gives birth to the Savior. That seems to be what it's leaning towards, but... I'll just be honest again, that's not an airtight case. There's a lot of dispute on that. But, but I do want us to at least hear that God is affirming the promise that salvation will come to the people of the world 
through a woman who will give birth to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, with all that said, I'm not sure that I've probably, maybe not handled the most significant objection that you may have to this. It's the most significant objection that we often hear when we come to a passage like this, and that is, doesn't this treat women as inferior to men? Doesn't this, isn't Paul just devaluing the place of women? If he says a woman has to submit, doesn't that make her less than, than a man? Is that what God is saying? Is that, is that what God is telling us in this text? Well, I want to say first of all, but I, then I'm going to unpack it. The answer you predict, no. Different roles do not indicate different value or worth. Right? There's where we might be bringing in some of our own cultural baggage here, where we automatically assume that a different role means different value. And that is consistently not the case in Scripture. Different role does not equal different value. What we see in this text instead is that the, the gospel is actually, actually changing and challenging all of our cultural assumptions. And this, by the way, is not just true about women. It's true for men, too, if you think about it. When, when God wants men to be leaders who are praying leaders, that challenges the way we often think of leadership, doesn't it, in our culture? Right? When we think of a strong leader, What's the kind of person that we think of? Dominant? I don't need anyone to help me. I'm going to do this alone. Maybe fierce. Maybe ruthless. Maybe willing to step on anyone if it means getting ahead. That's often how we see leadership. And if you are a leader and you're perceived as being dependent on a lot of other people, you might not, your, your value as a leader, your um, your abilities as a leader might be called into question. But in the gospel, in fact, in the person of Jesus Christ, we see the, the true and greatest leader. And do you know, and do you realize that Jesus spent immense amounts of time in prayer? And if there's anyone that you ever could make a case that really didn't need to pray, I mean, Jesus could have said, I'm one with the Father, I know the will of my Father, I am eternally co-existent with the Father. I mean, Jesus could have said that. We, none of us ever could, but Jesus could have. But he doesn't actually we see the opposite. We see Jesus so dependent on God in prayer. We see the kind of leader who is fully dependent and fully seeking out the will of his Father. And he's spending hours in prayer. And he's coming before God and he's praying with such intensity that, that, the, that the sweat is turning to drops of blood. That is the kind of leader that Jesus is. He is fully dependent on the Father. And for that matter, when you, when you think of women and the idea of submission, and we say right away, well, that means a woman, if you have to submit to someone, that means you're less than them, that means you're inferior. But ask, ask yourself this, would you ever make the case that Jesus the Son is inferior to the Father. Would you make the case that the Son is less than the Father in the, in the Trinity, in the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit? The answer is I don't, I don't think you would. We see all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, as, as equal. They all have different roles, but they are all equal. And in Jesus the Son, we see someone who routinely submits to his Father. Again and again and again. I have not come to do my will. I have come to do the will of the Father. I have not come for myself. I have come to serve my Father. He's praying in the garden, praying with those teardrops that turn to, to, to blood. And he says, if there's any other way, make that possible. Oh, but if not, I will do your will. Not my will, but your will. Jesus submitting himself to the will of the Father. Jesus surrendering himself, humbling himself, submitting cost of his life. It led to his death. It meant that he went to the cross. It meant that the nails were pounded through his hands and through his feet and the crown was put on his head, the crown of thorns, and he was whipped and he was beaten and he died a death surrendering to the will of the Father for us, for you, and for me. Tell me that's not beautiful. 
tell me that is not one of the most compelling things. You see, Church of Jesus Christ, when we, when we see this done right, when we see this done well, we get a picture of Christ himself. We see the beauty of Jesus. We are meant to show and to see the beauty of Christ in this. This is not meant to be repressive. It's not meant to be sexist. It's meant to show us the beauty of our Lord. Let's, let's desire to seek the beauty of Jesus as men and women in worship. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we've heard these words on it, it's still a challenging text. I pray that some of your glory and your beauty may have been revealed. And that as we seek to obey and to honor your word to us, that you would help us to do this. Help us to be people of prayer. Help us to be men in particular, but really all of us, people who lead by depending on you, submitting ourselves to you, surrendering ourselves to you. Help us to see the urgency of prayer. And as women, Lord, and all of us, but women in particular, let us honor uh, those in authority so that the world will gain a, a glimpse of the beauty of the one who submitted and surrendered all the way to death. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.